Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Internet of Things, a crystal ball for your field service team. I'm Sarah Nicastro, Editor-in-Chief of Field Technologies, and I'll be moderating today's event. At every conference I've attended this year, IoT was the most buzzed about topic. While it isn't a brand new technology, it is one that is now primed for use by organizations like yours to drive next level service. Today we have a panel of experts that are going to talk with you about what exactly IoT is and can do, and some of the ways in which it is and will continue to impact how field service organizations operate. Today you'll be hearing from Kirk Crenshaw, CMO of Telemetry, Melissa Morgan, Director of Product Marketing at ServiceMax, and Ken Remington, Senior Director of Product Strategy at ServiceMax. Following the presentations, we'll hold a Q&A session. You can feel free to submit questions as we go along. We'll get to as many as possible during the Q&A, and any that we don't have time for, we'll follow up on after the event. Before I hand it over to Kirk to begin today's presentation, we want to ask you a very quick poll question to get an idea of where you and your organization are at with Internet of Things. You should see that question popping up now, so please take a moment to type in your response. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kirk to introduce himself, and then we'll cir circle back to the poll resu results momentarily. Kirk? Thanks. So before I get started here, I just wanted to dive into a little bit about uh, what we do at Telemetry. Uh, we're an IoT enablement platform for the Internet of Things. Uh, we communicate with the sensors, devices, and machines out there in the field and collect the data coming out of those systems. And we take that data and transform it into useful information for key enterprise systems, just like ServiceMax. Uh, the unique thing that we bring to the table is that it doesn't matter uh, what kind of hardware, what kind of protocol that hardware is running. Um, it can be legacy, proprietary, even standard protocols. Uh, and the other thing, too, is we're enterprise ready. We can scale to any volume. So if you're running a thousand machines, uh, hundreds of thousands of machines, millions of machines, we can we can process that information. So let's take a step back, uh, Sarah. Let's, let's take a look at the uh, results of the poll. Absolutely. So um, it looks like uh, about, let's see here. Uh, the results should be popping up for you guys on the screen. It looks like about 12% of people aren't doing anything right now with IoT. Uh, about 44% are researching. Uh, about 15% are in the planning stage. Uh, about 19% um, have an IoT project in process. And about 10% have already implemented IoT. So it's interesting. Great, great. It's a, it's a great spread here. I, I, love the, uh, I love the spread of uh, uh, experience here uh, with IoT. And uh, so, what I'm going to dig into right now related to that is just kind of a, a primer uh, around IoT. I'm sure all of you have heard about it. You're on this webinar. Um, you've been hearing a lot with things like heart monitors, uh, automobile uh, telemetry, uh, environmental sensors, you know, a nest in your home. And you know, at its core, uh, IoT is the concept where physical devices capture information about their environment and they push that information through the Internet to uh, business systems to trigger business processes and allow you to take action. And kind of the focus today uh, I'm leaning towards is focusing more about the uh, enterprise uh, IoT and uh, what that means. Your customers are demanding uh, better and better solutions. They're getting used to services delivered through uh, smart products and IoT-enabled products. And because of that, they're becoming much more sophisticated, and your business needs to respond to that much more quickly and more creatively using data from these systems. And you know, with all the discussion that's going on, there's a lot of hype around this. So recently, Gartner released their hype cycle. And guess what ended up at the top? It was Internet of Things. The interesting thing here to note is that in 2012 and 2013, Gartner basically said, hey, it's going to be 10 years before we see any usefulness out of this, uh, before it reaches what's called its plateau of productivity. And the interesting thing with uh, this 2014 release of their hype cycle is that they now say it's five years. Well, the, the thing that I want to point out that I find is interesting is that this concept really isn't new. Now, we just go back to 1989. 25 years ago, right? Xerox released their flagship 
180 page a minute copier, which you know was great. But the cool thing that it did is it had a modem, and it would connect to Xerox headquarters, and it would tell Xerox when it was sick. Right? It needed more ink. It needed more. Um, so if something was wrong with it, uh, that it did more staples, and it would order staples. And that was really cool. But that was 25 years ago. And now let's go back even further. Let's look at 30 years ago, greater than 30 years ago, with SCADA. You know, th that was used to monitor and manage oil and gas refining systems. Uh, it's used in telecom. It's used in transportation. You know, and then 10 years ago, we had M2M, machine to machine. And then uh, as of today, now we call it Internet of Things. Uh, and that term actually was coined by Kevin Ashton back in 1999. So you can essentially think of IoT today as the fourth generation of SCADA. And at its core, the concept is, is that instead of humans creating data, humans pushing that information, that things are doing it themselves. Instead of me having to push a button, take a picture, uh, hit submit on a form that those systems are doing, them, doing it themselves. I'm hot, I'm cold, I need help. Now, why is it such a big topic these days? Well, there's a few things that are happening that, that are making it a big topic again, topic again. At its core, the enabling technology around it is getting cheaper, faster, and smaller. That technology is amazing, right? What you can do with a small microchip now blows me away. And another big part of that is the omnipresence of connectivity. It's easy to get a 3G connection. It's easy to get an LTE connection, a Wi-Fi connection. It's everywhere. And also attached to that is the big data and cloud infrastructures that are available. You have a ton of computing power available at your fingertips. You can scale quickly, and you can just rapidly grow any sort of implementation. And on top of that, consumer awareness is great, right? We know about the Nest. Uh, the maker movement is out there where you see lots of things becoming connected. Um, I have a geek at heart. I've really wired up my Halloween display this year. But all those things together are driving, driving this IoT concept. And an example is this quick set lock. I really want one. I haven't gotten one yet, but I really want one. It allows you to control your, your door lock from your iPhone. Um, and you see a lot of these products come to fruition. Right? So um, you see new projects on Kickstarter. You see new projects on Indiegogo. Um, you see lots of new connector products coming to bear. And all, but the interesting thing here is all of these things are exploding now because of this, these new capabilities, this ease of developing new products. But what does that mean at the end of the day? Well, Cisco is estimating that in, by 2020, there will be 50 billion connected objects. That's insane, 50 billion connected objects. And just kind of a reference point, there's going to only be 8 billion humans on the Earth at that time. And when you take a look at those 15 billion, 50 billion connected objects, that only represents 2.7% 2. 2 of things that are going to be out there. So the growth is going to be phenomenal. The explosion of uh, connected objects is going to be phenomenal. And all these things are talking. Right? You have your smart meter pushing out five terabyte, half a terabyte a, a day. And you know, when you look at airplanes, they're pushing out 10 terabytes. A point of reference here, too, is that in the past 2,000 years, the world has generated just a little bit more than two exabytes of data, right? We now generate that amount of data every single day. You know, these objects are creating a data explosion. Billions and billions of data points, billions and billions of devices are speaking. And, you know, we need to make sure that we can harness this information, harness this data, and make use of it. So. We need to make sure that you can make this information work for you, right? How do you transform all that information into something useful? How do you bring that information into key enterprise systems? And at the end of the day, drive additional customer satisfaction, create new products, new services, and improve operations. At the end of the day, creating a competitive advantage. So, you know, if you want to take a look uh, at your operations and 
understand what you have connected today, how do you make use of that right now? How do you make use of that information right now? So what I'm going to do is turn things over to Melissa, and she'll take you through some examples and use cases of actually taking advantage of IoT in your enterprise. Thanks so much, Kirk. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here today. I'm Melissa Morgan, the Director of Product Marketing here at ServiceMax. And I want to talk with you today about six ways IoT could shift how field service organizations operate, and in a lot of cases already is, and it sounds like from the poll we did at the beginning that many of you are already underway with thinking about IoT and how it's going to impact your business. We were actually in the office the other day talking about this webinar and talking about our Halloween party at the same time, and so the topic of a crystal ball came up. And I do think it's exciting to look at the future and see where field service could shift, and in some cases already is. So as I started to do some research for this webinar, one of the things I came across was the GE and Accenture report that came out recently on the Industrial Internet Insights for 2015. And the one stat that really jumped out to me was that 84% of the executives from industrial companies across the globe say that big data analytics has the power to dramatically alter the competitive landscape within just the next year. And I think that point of just the next year is really so important and speaks to what all of you are already working on in many cases. And not only that, they're investing accordingly. The other thing that I thought was interesting from that report is that they stated that big data was either their top priority or in the top three. So again, just speaking to how they're trying to get ahead of the curve here. And industrial manufacturers and healthcare sectors are in many cases in the first iteration or generation of putting forward these IoT and big data solutions, what GE essentially coins the industrial internet. So what I want to do today is to help inform your future conversations on this topic and help provoke some thoughts around what you're doing currently with IoT and how that's going to impact your service, service organization. So let's go ahead and walk through some of these six topics in terms of how IT, IoT could shift field service. So the first topic I want to focus on is probably more, one of the more basic, and that is M to M or machine to machine. And as Kirk mentioned, M to M and IoT has been around in different forms for some time. The change now is that this technology has just become much less expensive. There have been some breakthroughs with things like miniaturization that have occurred, and the cost to process and synthesize that data has also become a lot cheaper. If you look at the economic impact of this, research from iDate that came out says that the M2M market generated 24.2 billion euros in revenue in 2013. And Kirk mentioned Nest earlier. Google just bought Nest for $3.2 billion. So if you think about the, the impact that this is going to have on businesses and how it's going to transform competition and how your business is operating, as we move through these use cases and trends, I think you're really going to start to see how things are going to shift. But let's talk about a simple M to M use case for field service. It could be something as simple as a field service team setting up business rules logic to be notified by a machine like the MRI scan you can see on your slide in front of you when something goes wrong, and then triggering a work order and field service management software such as ServiceMax. So for instance, if the MRI scan on um, the helium levels, let's say, fall below a certain level, then that would automatically notify the company to go out and proactively repair that piece of equipment. And not only that, but the technician would know exactly what parts to bring, be arriving at exactly the right time. And the trick here is that once you know about a problem before the customer does, you're essentially delighting them because they don't even have to call you to complain about um, a break fix issue. You're going out and you're addressing the problem proactively. And so as someone who comes from a background in voice of the customer and customer experience, this really gets me excited because Think about a way to drive customer loyalty. And for those of you who follow Net Promoter, um, the idea of driving people to become promoters of your company and of your brand, once they have that um, kind of sense of delight, they're going to be driving viral word of mouth about your business, driving you know, positive references for your business, and that's only going to you know, increase your ability to drive service revenue and profitability. The other thing to think about is that early alerts that of impending failure of parts or components can also reduce breakdowns and enable more efficient service scheduling. And perhaps one day soon, we've been talking a lot about 3D printers here in our office. Um, a 3D printer could even help the technician print the part they need on the spot. So there's a lot of things that are exciting about M2M that are happening. And one of the customers that we work with here at ServiceMax, Electa, is already making M2M a reality. 
They're a billion dollar Swedish company that provides clinical solutions and services for cancer treatment and brain disorders, so pretty serious stuff. And the equipment that they're putting out there is helping patients and doctors, you know, in very critical situations that actually have the, the ability to save lives. And when ServiceMax partnered with Electa, one of the things they asked us to do was look at consolidating their sources of electronic and paper resources into one system to make all of that service knowledge for any Electa product easily accessible. And you can see on the slide in front of you some of the impacts that that's had to their business of working with ServiceMax and automating their field service processes and their knowledge information for their employees. 40% increase in first-time fixed rates, 10% decrease in average time to repair. Those are some exciting results. But there's another exciting storyline tied to Electa that I want to talk about, and that's tied to IoT. They've actually created an offering called Electa Intellimax that's a proactive intelligence device management system. And this system essentially establishes a continuous and safe dialogue between Electa equipment and a designated Electa service center. And where ServiceMax is coming in, we're actually allowing ServiceMax to connect to all the Electa equipment within those hospitals and help them service it. So as the company looks at this and the potential it holds, their vision is to eventually evolve to not just the Electa equipment, Electa equipment, but other equipment that's in that hospital that will enable them to service that and using ServiceMax to kind of um, help manage that process. And so that's an exciting opportunity for them in terms of future revenue generation with, with regards to service. The second way IoT is likely to reshape field service is around predictive maintenance. And with all of the data being collected from and on these assets, it seems really intuitive that a pattern optimizing equipment maintenance may emerge. And I know a lot of us think about preventative maintenance today and preventative maintenance service contracts and you know, using what we know about our products to try to create these contracts. But as we have this big data and these product clouds that are coming about with the smart connected devices, what all of that data can then be modeled to predict um, could really have some very significant outcomes, including things like practically eliminating the risk of a major failure of equipment, um, limited, limiting the inventory uh, that you need to have on hand, increasing reliability, and so on. And so once you start to understand more about these machines and equipment performance, you could also uncover a lot of other interesting information, such as usage data. So, for instance, if you know that one of your customers is using the equipment much more frequently, then maybe you ramp up um, the intervals of, of maintenance that you're offering them and extend their, the length of their service contracts. If they're using it less frequently, then perhaps you space out those intervals. And what happens if you're able to then share that information cross-functionally to sales or to support? Then they have more information to be able to upsell and cross-sell um, specific services that might benefit that particular customer. And one other potential ramification of that is looking at your service offerings. Once you have all of this data, what is that going to enable you to do to make sure you're creating the best service offerings for your customer? The other thing I want to talk about with predictive maintenance is the possible um, productivity and financial impact that this could have. The Operations and Maintenance Best Practices Report published by the U.S. Department of Energy shows that past studies have estimated predictive maintenance could reduce asset maintenance costs by 25 to 30% and reduce downtime by about 35%. It also makes sense to me as we talk about this topic that when a technician is deployed with, with the right parts at exactly the right time because you're essentially predicting that it's going to happen, that that would really improve first-time fixed rates and decrease mean time to repair. So some really um, important outcomes that could occur is predictive maintenance moves along the maturity curve and goes from being something that early adopters are testing out to something that becomes more of a mainstream occurrence within service organizations. The third topic I want to touch on today with regards to IoT is servitization. And servitization, again, is not a new topic, which seems to be a trend today, but is because of IoT is becoming more popular and more talked about in terms of what it could become and the value it could provide. So Andy Neely, who's the director of the Cambridge Service Alliance at the University of Cambridge, defines servitization as the innovation of an organization's capabilities and processes to better create mutual value. And I think that mutual value phrase within that definition is so important, and we can talk a little bit more about that, through a shift from selling product to selling product service systems. And to me, when he talks about value, and I recently read, if you, guys, if you haven't seen this yet, I go, encourage you to go to Harvard Business Review for November and read the new article that came out from 
Michael Porter on the topic of smart connected devices and competition, but it's really this value that's going to enable service organizations to figure out how to essentially sell service um, as an outcome. So instead of selling the product, you're focusing on the outcome that that product is going to deliver and the value that that provides to your customer. Now, if you're collecting all of this data from your customers, you can really start to understand what are the things that are going to drive the most value for them and how can I create these value-added service offerings that are really going to enable them to um, get the most out of my services. And I know GE is talking a lot about and doing, thinking a lot about this already um, that they talked about at their conferences. And I think that this is something that, for those in manufacturing, is probably going to have the largest impact we also have to think about what it means to manufacture those smart connected devices and the increased cost that that might bear in terms of adding intelligence and sensors to all of this equipment and machinery. But when you think about how knowing more about how customers are using your products allows you to extend those value added services and the impact that could have on things like customer loyalty and lifetime value and also potentially increase switching costs for customers because as they have access to all this historical data related to products, and um, are basically essentially getting that high level of value because they're essentially being sold the capabilities of the products that they're buying. Um, I think a lot of that benefit will offset the additional costs of manufacturing and producing products that are smart um, and what that means um, for margins. One of the most well-known examples of servitization is Rolls-Royce selling power by the hour, which has been around for decades. Rolls-Royce provides all the support, including maintenance, to ensure that engines can continue to deliver their power. And what this did is actually align the interests of the manufacturer and the operator, who only paid for engines that performed well. So you can see the chart on the screen in front, in front of you. Services revenue is at least four times the net original equipment selling price, and 47% of all revenue from Rolls-Royce is coming from services and 47% of services revenue is now under total care contracts, which is where that power by the hour rolls into. So just um, a very great example of servitization, one of the classic examples. And then when you think about how IoT is going to drive further future intelligence into this, I think it only gets more exciting. Another example of disruptive innovation for services and focusing on outcomes for the customer is Hilti, which is a power tool company, and they are, they basically are offering their fleet tool management service, replacing the traditional tool sale with a service that provides and manages the tools that construction companies need. And the thought process behind offering this service is that the, their customer doesn't make money by owning tools, they actually make money by using tools that work. So imagine, again, how this could evolve further if the tools eventually become smart connected devices and what that will mean for the, the value added services that Hilti could offer to their customers. The fourth IoT use case that I want to look at today is for equipment tracking and device location, and also how wearables could potentially come into play. Apple has come up with the iBeacon, which is an indoor proximity system that uses low-cost transmitters to notify nearby iOS devices of their presence. And the technology actually enables a smartphone or other device to perform actions when it's in close proximity to that iBeacon, such as pulling up a retail offer for shoes, um, if you're walking by a shoe store. So what could this tracking and device location capability mean for field service. A beacon that directs a technician to equipment or a device location in a large facility, saving them time is one potential idea. Um, just to kind of flesh out this example, if a tech arrives at the site, he can easily get to know what the number of assets on site are, what their problems are, and easily diagnose those problems with the proper documentation or knowledge articles right from their Google Glass or other wearable device. How's that for something that Sounds really exciting and futuristic. We actually were just at the Dreamforce conference and we had a little iBeacon on our booth. And so that's something that I thought was a really neat technology and hopefully some of you can start to envision what that might mean for your service business. Use case number five looks really futuristic, but Amazon is already hyping their drone delivery strategy. So imagine this for a minute when you think about automated installation. A drone flies or maneuvers to the site of the new installation of your product, takes the measurements that it needs to ensure a successful installation at the location. Then your product self-deploys its connection to the IoT or Internet of Things and begins collecting data on its performance. 
as to, while this is all happening, the service agent monitors the installation remotely. So no one's actually going physically out to the site. This is all kind of happening behind the scenes. I think this is really neat. Uh, again, I think this is probably one of the things that's more futuristic, but how far away is the future? And then the last use case I want to talk to, uh, to you about today is really more transformative. So how can IoT and big data really transform how you're repairing, selling, and building products? One example I like to think about when I talk about this is Tesla, because they're already doing some of this with their firmware in terms of how they upgrade and maintain their cars. They push out, they have a one-to-many model essentially where they're pushing out any fixes or updates to the Tesla cars through their firmware system. And it's essentially transforming how they're repairing. You no longer have to take your car into a service station, they're just pushing a fix over the firmware system. So. Um, I think that's just one really neat example of how um, IoT and big data really have the ability to transform things. The other thing that um, Porter mentions in his article is this concept of monitoring. So with all of this big data that's out there, you're really just constantly monitoring what's happening with all of your products. And once you start to know more about the equipment performance and errors, that really transforms how you're going to deliver service. Maybe you don't have to send out a tech anymore. Instead, you can use the knowledge base to diagnose an issue, the issue and, and create a field change order right on the fly. So again, I think people are going to have to take a look at their value chains, at the structure of their service organizations as a result of some of these transformative technologies that are going to come about. Another example is Diebold, um, who monitors many of its ATM machines for early signs of trouble. After assessing a malfunctioning ATM status, the machines repaired remotely or the company deploys a tech who's been given a detailed diagnosis of the problem. Diebold's ATMs can also be updated when they're due for feature enhancements, and often these can occur remotely via software. So again, just some really cool examples of people that are already starting to use IoT to their benefit and really transform how they're delivering the service. The other potential way this has to impact your organization is through product feedback. So as you start to collect all this data and analytics, Perhaps you learn a lot of useful things about how your products are performing in certain climates, certain environments, um, and you can share that information back with the product organization so that they can adjust their design strategy um, and R&D now has this information to continuously improve your products using this data. And the last topic I do want to touch on with regards to transformation is transforming how you think about sales and selling. Because once you have access to this information, how can you distribute it so that the sales team constantly knows kind of where the customer is at, what's driving value for them, to continuously look at upsell and cross-sell opportunities, how to um, lengthen their service contracts appropriately, and make sure that we're really selling the value of the capabilities of the products, not the products themselves. So that's really what I wanted to talk about today in terms of how IoT has the ability to impact field service. I hope you found some of this enlightening. If, so, if you're doing some of it already, I know we'd love to hear about it, so please put, feel free to post in the chat or the Q&A afterwards and share your examples. We'd love to hear those and be able to share them back with the audience. And at this point, I'm going to turn the webinar over to my colleague, Ken Remington, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about how ServiceMax views IoT. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm excited to be here with our audience today. and. Uh, uh, by way of introduction, I'm Ken Remington. I am the Senior Director of Product Strategy uh, for ServiceMax. Uh, and we'll talk a little about how uh, ServiceMax uh, and our partners like Telemetry uh, are working with our clients today uh, to deliver uh, uh, value from the industrial Internet of Things. Um, <clears throat> when we start to take a look at that uh, from a uh, uh, a services economy uh, and the forces that are shaping it, uh, we have to think about service innovation um, and the business drivers and trends that are driving that uh, along with the technology. So as, uh, um, I, as Melissa and Kirk have talked about today, there are a lot of different examples uh, of this. Um, you know, certainly the trends around um, uh, um, servitization uh, end-to-end uh, business processes from a services perspective uh, and, uh, and going from reactive to predictive are things that uh, we hear from our clients uh, are paramount uh, to their success uh, in the market. Uh, the, uh, the move to the cloud 
and being able to uh, connect to all those devices uh, out there and be able to then communicate that across your organization uh, to help uh, increase your uh, net promoter score, um, increase uh, service revenues, uh, reduce your costs, uh, meet uh, various different commitments with your clients, both from a contractual and regulatory perspective, are, are all things that are driving the new service economy. As we look at uh, uh, the future of service uh, from that perspective, uh, we're really starting to look at those business drivers again. Um, how do I take uh, service is everything or uh, the uh, uh, service is the product um, kind of view of, of, uh, of your future uh, services business uh, and marry those with the trends that are out there today. Uh, the hype that we just talked about from an internet of, uh, industrial internet of thing uh, is starting to become a reality and we'll talk about how ServiceMax um, uh, provides that today uh, with clients like Electa. Um, and others, uh, and then be able to access all that data, um, both structured and unstructured, and be able to make sense of it uh, from an operational standpoint. Uh, that's where uh, we're uniquely um, uh, uh, positioned uh, in the marketplace uh, to be able to take all of that connected, those connected devices, uh, and the information that is pouring out, um, you know, uh, to uh, uh, exabytes of information a day across all those connected pieces of equipment start to get unwieldy. Um, and you need to be able to make sense of that. Um, uh, ServiceMax has built a solution that drives the insights into that information that's flowing in from your equipment um, or your customer's equipment uh, and be able to then give you real-time control and automate the process uh, so that you can be there before there's a problem. Uh, your technicians can show up um, and, again, uh, um, uh, over meet the expectations to their clients, uh, to your clients, um, drive uh, a better first-time fix rate, um, reduce your mean time uh, uh, to repair, uh, keep uptime uh, for your equipment, and that's important when you start to look at servitization, right, GE, in their power generation uh, organization uh, is selling uh, um, energy uh, uh, power uh, by the minute uh, to their clients. Um, and so uh, keeping the, uh, uh, um, the power generation plant uh, continue to deliver power and energy to their clients' clients is an extremely important uh, factor. Um, and, uh, and be able to monitor that equipment and look at potential trends that are occurring from the data that's flowing from that equipment uh, and then be able to uh, do both uh, predictive uh, analytics and be able to start to meet your customers' needs before they even know uh, they exist uh, is an important uh, factor when you start to look at um, turning those operational practices uh, and the new connected uh, environment to, uh, uh, to your clients. If we just take a look at a couple use cases, um, you know, the traditional call center operations, you know, usually has some kind of channel in. Um, traditionally, it's been, you know, uh, a, a customer calls into a call center um, and uh, coordinates either a repair over the phone, uh, troubleshooting, or uh, may push that to either a remote engineer or a field engineer to go out and solve that particular problem. You know, they also have provided uh, self-service through customer portals or communities, uh, partner communities, to be able to facilitate um, those particular incidents that may occur that then need uh, field service um, and, and a technician out on site to solve those problems, as well as email support, SMS support, a lot of different channels that come in uh, to be able to support that in the current model. Um, and traditionally, you've got to staff up a, a call center, um, a set of dispatch or call coordinators to be able to work with your field and then be able to deliver those services as needed uh, in the process. Uh, what ServiceMax has done from a uh, solution perspective is allow you to start to connect to your equipment. So as you have your uh, equipment 
uh, sold to, installed, leased, rented uh, to your customer base. Um, it's communicating back through the Internet, um, through various different carriers. Uh, one of the ones that's uh, very interesting is, for example, Cisco and their fog computing platform, where at the edge of that technology, uh, you're able to uh, use that computing platform to narrow down or filter the streaming data that your equipment may be um, uh, communicating and be able to uh, very cogently send information to uh, a, uh, a, 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 an Internet of Things uh, solution provider like telemetry uh, or work with uh, OEM solutions like uh, uh, General Electric's Predix system uh, to then manage it through a business rules engine and uh, be able to signal um, the need for either remote service where an engineer can get in, get online, work with the client, and do that firmware upgrade that Melissa talked about with Tesla and be able to automatically update the firmware and, and uh, provide a solution uh, without ever, ever having to deliver that uh, from, a, uh, uh, from an on-site perspective or have the client uh, come to uh, the dealer to get that problem resolved. Uh, the other solution um, that, that, that we see most often uh, in a lot of our clients' business is the emergency service, the break fix that occurs. And as you're getting that streaming data from your equipment, we're able to trap the, that information uh, or telemetry is and be able to then pass the information based on business rules that say, for this type of information within this particular uh, range of information or threshold, we're going to need to open up a service ticket. This reduces the need for the customer to call into a call center. It allows you to reduce your call center um, uh, staffing, your dispatch staffing, because now there's no dispatch involved. The system, ServiceMax, is going to find the most appropriate engineer in the region that has the right skills, has the right parts that are available, or maybe they've got their 3D printer uh, with them, and they're going to arrive on site maybe before the customer even knows that there's a problem and be able to resolve that uh, as quickly as possible, uh, again, maintaining uptime for the client, uh, reducing the overtime uh, uh, that may be uh, um, uh, required to, uh, uh, to fix that problem long term uh, and, uh, and make the technician as productive as possible. We can also feed that through our optimization engine so that it then looks at and finds the best scheduled time to meet and communicate with the customer that there may be some issue that's uh, happening with their piece of equipment. It's not an emergency fix, but there may be a corrective maintenance or preventive maintenance activity that should go on and, again, get into that predictive mode. Uh, and then uh, usage-based service. So as the equipment is saying, hey, I'm running low on toner or I'm running low on helium, um, I'm able to now uh, 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 trigger uh, through the system uh, a uh, order fulfillment, a part order fulfillment, and get that, those pieces, of those, that material, uh, those consumables or wearables uh, out to the customer site uh, and have the technician arrive at the same time so they can go ahead and deliver that service. This actual uh, use case is something that we're doing today with our clients. So we use uh, um, uh, our solution called Product Pulse uh, to communicate um, and be able to trigger the remote service, the emergency service, the usage-based service uh, that your equipment is yearning for or calling out for. Uh, we partner with telemetry to be able to really put some intelligence behind that and be able to then collect all of that unstructured data um, that you may be getting from your piece of equipment and start to take the next step uh, in the evolution. And that's really uh, what we would say is the industrial Internet of Things and predictive analytics. Um, the equipment is still chatting, um, still bringing that information in. Um, certainly there are activities, service activities that can get triggered. But now how do you take that and start to get a little more predictive, um, a little more um, proactive in, in uh, reaching out to your customers 
or uh, solving a systemic problem with a particular product family line or model um, or some kind of environmental uh, component that may be being raised by the equipment in that region. So uh, as you get that information, you're going to then be able to take that big data repository um, and relate it to the operational data within ServiceMax, you know, within your service system, essentially filtering that data that's coming from telemetry, running it through the appropriate business rules, and then making the, the connection between, uh, for example, uh, a usage pattern uh, of a particular piece of equipment could be a single serialized unit that is, you know, um, uh, being overutilized, and you want to uh, in, increase or um, uh, move forward uh, a preventive or corrective maintenance activity so that that piece of machinery is not going to go down in the future. So if you may set up a, you know, a preventive maintenance every three months, now you see that the equipment is starting to be overutilized, um, that the system can then start to make recommendations uh, to the business that, hey, we, we, you should actually, instead of every three months, you should make an appointment out there uh, the next time you're in the area, uh, perform this preventive maintenance and give that information to the technician while they're in those areas. Uh, again, if we come back to things like iBeacon um, or proximity, um, you know, those things can start to reach out as well. So it's not just your equipment, uh, but it may be the location of the equipment comp uh, uh, related to where the technicians are in a particular geography. Uh, and so uh, we're very excited about working with telemetry and um, being able to connect that operational data that gets insights uh, back to the, to the company. One other um, uh, final use case is being able to take that information from a serviceability perspective, being able to take the symptoms that uh, the equipment is, uh, is communicating um, and based on uh, failure codes, based on um, codification that a technician may get involved in uh, and pull information back from a diagnostic perspective, a troubleshooting perspective, essentially data collection at the point uh, of, uh, of interaction with that piece of equipment, be able to start to pull that information back in related again to a particular product family, product line, uh, uh, product model, um, uh, a particular region or a set of strategic accounts and uh, identify a, uh, a potential problem, a systemic problem that then may result in a corrective action uh, or corrective maintenance, a field change order, if you will, uh, in the field that's going to, again, uh, reduce the repair uh, or uh, uh, emergency uh, break-fix type of activity. Um, you know, and, and so we think that this is where the industry is going, um, and, uh, and, and we're uh, working with our partners as well as uh, with our solution to be able to provide this capability. So uh, in summary, um, you know, with ServiceMax end-to-end field service solution uh, you know, and the service operations data that we're collecting today in a structured and unstructured form, uh, we're able to um, then correlate the connected devices, the information that may be uh, very tactical in nature as well as uh, um, analytical uh, from an insights perspective uh, using that big data, analyze that information, make good business decisions, uh, become a little more predictive uh, or proactive with my market um, and improve my uh, competitive position uh, in the market as well. Uh, and that comes full circle. So now I can take that information, I can drive it from a serviceability perspective and, and, uh, and design in serviceability and design out potential issues uh, that occur in the field. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Sarah. Thank you, Ken. Uh, thank you very much, all three of you. That was great information, and we have a lot of questions here, so we're going to start getting through those and see how many we can get to. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, any that we aren't able to get to uh, in the next you know, uh, few minutes here, we will certainly follow up on. Um, so Kirk, I'm going to start with a question for you. 
Um, yeah. So you were talking about the high volume of data that's generated with these IoT applications. And so the question is, um, and this is a, a common question that, that we hear, like, is all of the data important? How do I determine what data is actually important to use? Do I need to save all of it? So can you talk a little bit uh, about, you know, how you determine which data is going to be useful for you and, and how you can manage that process? Sure. Yeah, we've, we've seen a whole spectrum of uh, answers for this in working with our customers. In some cases, uh, the solution that we're working on is relatively simple, where it's a device that's essentially saying that it's okay 99.99% of the time. And in those circumstances, we've seen uh, our customers decide, hey, you know, maybe we can let uh, most of that data fall. We just want the the key points that uh, come up in terms of hey, you know, there's there's trouble. I'm out of I'm out of spec. Uh, but it ranges uh, in in terms of uh, importance of that data. If you're talking about um, super sensitive equipment, um, that's uh, critical to keep up and running and monitored on a on a constant basis. In those cases, we've seen people uh, keep all the little bits of data from those systems, um, sometimes years, um, sometimes you know, multiple years. So they can do a couple things. They can understand ongoing trends with the performance of that uh, piece of equipment. And they can also uh, take a step back in terms of understanding trends, uh, discover uh, breakpoints for uh, those systems. You know, it, it, it basically comes down to what your application is, how mission critical is that particular application, and um, you know some some of our customers even look forward to uh, the future, saying, "Hey, you know there may be a piece of data in there that uh, uh, becomes important to me down the line, so I want to see that as well." So it, you know, it's a whole spectrum of uh, of answers there. Okay, great. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I know that a lot of the folks that. Um, we've done articles on in the magazine, you know, they're really using sort of what you mentioned, like that exception exception data, you know. So if you have a piece of equipment and it's at a customer site, you don't need an update, you know, telling you, hey, everything's great, you know, you just need an update when something, you know, is, is off or starts to go wrong. So that's one way. But plenty of other applications where, you know, there's other uses for some of that data as well. Um, Melissa, I want to ask you a related question. So the data that we're talking about here, how does ServiceMax use that data that's collected from the machines today? So I think Ken just touched on some of that. And, but one of the kind of more simple examples that I can share is just the idea that if the machine or equipment has some sort of an error, they're essentially, um, we're collecting that data and then triggering a work order in ServiceMax and Ken, I don't know if you want to share any other examples of how we're collecting data. I think you just shared some, but yeah, I, I think that uh, you're absolutely right. The, the uh, you know, uh, if we look at, uh, for example, the uh, the Electa um, uh, example, not only are they triggering you know uh, work orders and optimizing uh, their field uh, engineers to uh, uh, to be able to re react quicker. Um, but they're also looking at that information uh, about the equipment that's chatting. And be able to provide that kind of status uh, at this point back to the client. Um, and so uh, as they're collecting data, there could be performance information, there could be quality information um, that they can share with the client that the client may either not know uh, that it exists or you know, don't, doesn't have time. So they're a actually offering it as a value add service. Okay, great. Um, so the next question here is asking, um, does an M2M notification qualify as a complaint in the FDA's definition for reporting? Oh, great question. Um, so it really depends on you know, your, your, uh, your levels of complaint. Um, it certainly could if there's an adverse effect. Um, so, uh, you know, if we take the, uh, our uh, a partnership with telemetry, uh, you would set up those business policies, those rules that say, um, based on the information that we're gathering and filtering for um, from that equipment, if 
it's identified as a potential adverse uh, um, uh, situation, then it could trigger a complaint um, that then needs to be handled, right? Uh, and how you handle that, um, you know, through your quality management system and reporting back to the FDA uh, is something that uh, certainly could be automated. Um, uh, but I think that there's probably some human intervention um, as those things get raised as potential complaints you're going to have somebody managing that and then facilitate the automatic reporting back up to the FDA. Okay, got it. Um, okay, so the next question here is asking, um, what about our customers' IT rules that may not allow a connection between the instrument and our office? Oh, sure. Um, so, uh, again, uh, 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 Service Max is uniquely uh, positioned uh, in this uh, in this use case. Um, there are certainly uh, a lot of our clients um, where uh, either their end clients uh, will not provide give them access uh, over the internet, um, or your IT organization uh, is uh, concerned with security and privacy issues. Uh, we understand that, um, and uh, but those pieces of equipment still are, are collecting data. So when a technician um, is out in the field, um, there is you know, uh, um, an ability with our mobile applications to connect in. Um, so we may not be streaming that information over the Internet and monitoring it because of business policy uh, or rules, uh, but when the technician arrives, uh, engineer arrives, they can um, uh, connect in uh, to the device uh, and gather uh, you know, not just diagnostic information, um, but, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and the troubleshooting information and what they did, but also, you know, the information that it's collecting that, uh, you know, has been identified from a business perspective that they want to bring back and hold at what we call the install product or install base perspective. Again, now taking that information, putting it into the big data repository and being able to correlate it back uh, to your customer's equipment and then be able to uh, use it from an analytics perspective uh, and so forth. So there are a lot of different ways to connect um, that can be done via, you know, Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, as, uh, as Kurt talked about, Bluetooth, um, you know, uh, uh, connections as well, uh, and be able to collect that data uh, in a more one-to-one uh, -one fashion, if you will. Um, okay. The other uh, potential way to, to solve that problem uh, is, you know, through uh, data encryption and, and security capabilities. Uh, we partner with several vendors that uh, on the force.com platform that can provide you with a very secure encrypted environment, um, and, uh, and that may be able to pass your IT policies. Okay, great. Um, Kirk, we have a, a question here for you asking if you can kind of compare yourself with a company like Exceda, uh, or, you know, those types of folks, just kind of explain, you know, the, the differences or similarities there. So uh, when uh, people compare us to, to companies like that, uh, kind of where we stand out is, uh, I would say, in three different areas. First of all, um, we can connect to any sort of hardware, hardware running any sort of protocol. We have a lot of success uh, working with companies that have either proprietary protocols built into their uh, equipment or even, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20-year-old protocols running on older uh, systems. Um, and that's one area. You know, we, we make it uh, easy to connect. Uh, you can um, get up and running quickly in, uh, in respect to uh, environments like that. The other thing, uh, too, that comes up a lot is the scale that we can handle. Uh, we can scale quickly. We can scale massively. We have, uh, you know, just one customer who processes over uh, 67,000 messages a second uh, through our platform. You know, so we can run at a scale much greater than, than most of our uh, competitors out there. And the speed uh, that we allow in terms of processing the data and the speed to market, uh, right, we can get you up and running quickly, um, minimizing the time that you're um, – working on getting these solutions put together. And then, then those are the, I would say those are the, the three main areas that we that we kind of stand apart. Okay, good. Um, Ken, there's a question here for you. It says, Ken said, ServiceMax has built a system that gives insight into data. Can you describe that system or tool? 
Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so uh, we have uh, a, a solution uh, that we're uh, that we call the Insights Engine. Um, it is um, uh, it, it does two things. It it connects to the big data uh, repository. Um, it helps uh, uh, filter out uh, um, and correlate the data uh, to the structured data uh, within the service operations system, uh, and then uh, with the with the analytics uh, engine uh, that uh, that comes with it uh, enables you to uh, start to gain some insights. Uh, look at um, the uh, um, uh, the data uh, uh, across various different uh, factors um, and, and axes, uh, and uh, and in the future, uh, it, we the Insights Engine will then uh, start to be able to uh, provide recommendations uh, back to uh, uh, the business. Uh, that is uh, that is a, a future uh, for the Insights Engine. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I am going to say, Kirk, this one uh, we can have you respond to. And it's a good Sorry. question, but it's, it's, it's a question of who actually owns the data. It's uh, another answer uh, that is, depends. <laughs> We've seen uh, a variety of uh, cases here where um, our end customer, our direct customer, uh, provides a service to their customer where um, our customer directly owns the data, um, provides it as part of a service, even charges in, in uh, some cases for that data. Um, in a number of other cases, too, uh, we have customers who actually supply their end customer with the information. Their end customer owns that information and determines what can be done with it. So a part of the process of putting together these solutions is deciding, you know, where, do, where does the data reside? Um, who actually owns that information, who gets access to it. Uh, we have some customers even uh, have agreements with their customers, with their customers where um, their end customer owns the information, but they allow them to anonymize that data across all their customers so they can run comparisons. I don't know, I have a, I have a smart meter uh, on my um, gas meter, and uh, my electric company, owns the data, but they also give me the, the ability to take a look at um, that information across all the ho households in my neighborhood to see how I compare to that. So, you know, at the other day, the answer is depends. Uh, depends what you want to do with the data. Depends how sensitive it is. Um, we even have some customers who have extremely sensitive data, and they spin up what's called an AMI, uh, a private cloud on Amazon, and they, all the data resides there. So we don't have access to it. We can't see it. Um, and they can determine what exactly what happens with that information, if they want to keep it within their own uh, systems or if they want to push that out as well. Okay, good. All right, great. Well, I think we're out of time. Um, thank you so much to Kirk, Melissa, and Ken for, uh, for joining us and for sharing your insight. There were a number of questions we weren't able to get to, uh, some of which were pretty detailed. So just rest assured that um, ServiceMax will follow up with you guys and make sure that they get you all of the information that you're looking for. Um, Thanks again to, to everyone in the audience for uh, spending some time with us today. We appreciate it and hope everyone has a great afternoon.